Warning. Concentrated ammonia is corrosive. Ammonia and nitrogen oxides are irritating and toxic. Nitric acid is highly oxidizing. Work in a well-ventilated area. This experiment involves very high temperatures. Hi guys, here is MIH. As many old viewers to my channel know, I have been attempting to synthesize nitric acid and nitrates from ammonia via the Oswald process for quite a long time. The last published attempt was on January 25th, and I've done several small-scale tests before and after that date. Nonetheless, all of the test runs were quite a long time ago, and I want to revisit the project partly because I really need nitric acid now, and partly because synthesizing nitric acid with those relatively simple setups and materials is my personal trophy of success. And without further ado, I am very proud to announce that I successfully synthesized a sizable quantity of decently pure potassium nitrate from ammonia, potassium carbonate, and chromium oxide only, and with simple pieces of glossware. We will now get into the actual process and how it was done. I will repeat the basic principle of the Oswald process here. The Oswald process generates nitric oxide by passing a mixture of ammonia gas and air through a red-hot tube filled with a catalyst. Then, the nitric oxide is oxidized by the remaining air to generate nitrogen dioxide, which is absorbed into water to make nitric acid. Ammonia cannot burn in air and doesn't oxidize easily. This is why the catalyst for choice is extremely important. Industrial productions use platinum wires or platinum fused in substrates such as zeolite. I made some platinum fused quartz wool in a previous video, but it wasn't very successful. So instead, I gave a try on platinum wires. Here is a piece of 10cm by 0.1mm platinum wire. It was slightly bigger than I thought, and you can see that it is very shiny. I connected the wire to two alligator clips and set my limiting current to 0.08 amps. It is very important to set a limiting current and go up slowly, or else the wire may melt. The power was turned on and nothing happens because the current is too small. I then slowly cranked up the current until the wire begins to glow red hot. The current now was about 1.5 amps and I set the limiting current to this value. I then set up a simple testing apparatus with a conical flask, some paper clips, and the platinum wire. The wire was hanged beneath the series of paper clips, which will pass on the current. I turn on the power and the platinum wire is glowing nicely. The current was limited at 1.5 amps. Here I change the current limit slightly and the platinum wire changes its brightness as well. With this critical piece done, I can assemble the rest of the apparatus. I connected a small conical flask before the catalyst chamber. The tube on the left will feed air through the concentrated ammonia sitting in the flask and the air-ammonia mixture will flow out on the right to the catalyst chamber. The nitrogen oxides then leave at the top and passes through an absorption flask filled with some potassium carbonate solution. The remaining nitrogen oxides is then passed on to the beaker filled with sodium hydroxide as a final scrubbing. I finished assembling the apparatus. I tested the air pump and it worked fine. The platinum wire, however, had some trouble lighting up. It seems like that the connection point of the wire with the paper clips isn't very stable. Upon some adjustments, the wire eventually lit up. I then filled the reagents inside the containers. The first ammonia flask is filled with about 17 grams of 25% ammonia, which represents roughly a quarter of a mole. 20 grams of anhydrous potassium carbonate, which is a slight excess to the ammonia, was weighted out and mixed with a little bit of water. This is filled in the main absorption flask. Finally, about 10 grams of sodium hydroxide was weighted out and mixed with some water in the final scrubber. After getting everything all set, I am ready for my first run. I first opened the air pump, but it seems like the apparatus was leaking gas since the absorption flasks didn't have air building out. Moreover, the platinum wire wasn't working again. I quickly fixed it and went with another run. This time it worked pretty nicely. Oh yes, yes it worked. See? It worked, it actually worked. It was glowing far brighter because of the oxidation of ammonia on the platinum wire. Wow.
spectacular view. Okay, I'm gonna keep injecting the ammonia. Yep, it's it's going brighter and brighter. There we go. Yes. Yes. Hell yeah. See, even if I turn off the power, it is still lit. Which clearly means that the reaction is actually going on the platinum. Oh shit, I think the platinum's gonna melt if we light it up like this. Yeah, gonna close off the power. But anyways, you can see there's a bunch of water mists on the flask. And that is because the reaction produces water. And also I can feel the heat from the flask. It's like going pretty hot like worm here. So yeah, I'm pretty sure that the reaction worked. Um, I think this time I actually did get the thing sort of working continuously. You can see that the wire is lit. And I think I removed the the wire connections. So yeah. And it was reasonably airtight, so... Yeah, I'm just gonna let this run for a bit. Huh, guess what? Our platinum melted. Like, it literally just melted off the sides. You can imagine how hot it was. But, guess what? It's still glowing. Which basically means we, we succeeded. Yeah, the reaction is working. The, the remaining pieces are still glowing. The platinum wire kept melting and disconnecting, so I have to give it up. Fortunately, we got another alternative route which involves chromium-3 oxide as a catalyst. However, unlike the platinum which has a high cell activity, the chromium oxide oxidizes some of the ammonia to nitrogen gas instead of our desired nitric oxide, so it will be less efficient. Yes, I finally got it to work. Um, I, I exchanged the catalyst to be some, um, some chromium uh, oxide that I made by decomposing some ammonium dichromate in a test tube, which you can see is here. I filled this uh, chromium oxide inside this normal glass tube and then I uh, lightly heated it with a blowtorch and guess what, the reaction started. And already you can see a bunch of fumes being produced. Um, the yellow fume is obviously the nitrogen dioxide. And those white fumes are actually the ammonium nitrate from the solu from the from the reaction. I don't even have to keep the heating. You can see that, although there were not apparent signs of reaction, the fumes are certainly like pretty yellowish. So yeah. Okay. Um, the apparatus has been running for a few minutes. Now you may think that the reaction is not going because. Uh, although we have color in the flask, it's not really darkening and you can see that there are no like red color in the catalyst bed. However, I can easily prove that the reaction is still working by touching a piece of normal tissue paper to the tube to see if it would even burn. Yeah, when I put it closer, you can see some burn marks on the paper, which tells me that the catalyst bed is still working at a decently high temperature. Which means, yeah, the reaction is still working. Um, small modification to the system. You can see at the last scrubber of sodium hydroxide, I've installed a makeshift bubbler. It's basically a pipette with a bunch of holes punched inside. And I think it's working more smoothly than it has been. So yeah, that's pretty nice. The yellow color is rebuilding up. So I'm just gonna leave it run until I come back from lunch. After lunch, the reaction stopped, and I suspected that the ammonia is running out, so I changed for some fresh concentrated ammonia and restarted. Surprisingly, the catalyst bed glowed extremely brightly under the concentrated ammonia gas flow. The concentrated ammonia allows for a more vigorous and exothermic reaction, which can keep the catalyst extremely hot. A while later, the catalyst only glowed a little bit, but the reaction is still going. To show this, I turn off the pump and the glow disappears. When the gas flow continues, the glow reappears. As I said before, the catalytic oxidation of ammonia releases tremendous amounts of heat and is even able to act as a heat source once it is initiated. Note that the gases in the conical flask was a lot lighter in color and contained a bunch of white fumes. 
This was the transition from the third stage of the reaction to the second stage, as I call it. I discovered that the reaction takes on three distinct stages. During the first stage, the reaction didn't start at all, and the flask, being filled with ammonia, stays clear and colorless. When the catalytic reaction starts, the catalyst glows and white fumes of ammonium nitrate appears in the flask. Finally, the third stage, which is the stable production stage, begins when the fumes all disappear, and the gas turns entirely brown. The first and third stage may be confusing to distinguish, especially when the nitrogen dioxide concentration is too low and the brown color isn't obvious. However, keep in mind that as long as the catalyst glows, the reaction must be going, and when the catalyst stops glowing, the ammonia is nearly depleted, and it is now time to change the ammonia solution to a more concentrated one. The reactor sustains at the third stage, and a stable, rich brown color is observed in the large flask. The absorbing flasks were generating a lot of ammonium nitrate fumes, but apart from that, they're doing a great job, and no nitrogen oxides can be seen or smelled. After a few minutes, the catalyst stops glowing, and I added some concentrated ammonium. I also covered the catalyst bed with a bunch of ceramic wool, and this will insulate it and keep it self-sustaining. The absorbing flasks were running nicely, and their pH is still strongly alkaline, meaning that they can still absorb more nitrogen oxides. If the pH falls to about 8, then consider adding some more alkali to the flasks to ensure complete absorption. Okay guys, um, here we are after something like 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, you can see, you can already see a little bit of fuming inside this flask which means that our ammonia is getting depleted and if we check our catalyst bed it is well it is no longer glowing which tells us that it is actually depleted so now we will now I'll demonstrate you uh, a refill of ammonia and how that will impact the overall setup so now I'm gonna turn the pump off first and then just crank this flask off. This time I'm not gonna add ammonia to this flask anymore because I decided to change a flask. Hang on. Okay, here is the flask taken off. When you smell it, you can obviously still smell ammonia. Yeah, still there, but it was a lot weaker than before. Like, I... I... Like, I, I can't dare myself to smell concentrated ammonia at all, but I can safely smell this. Which means, there are not a lot of ammonia left, which is exactly why we have to refill it. I have just poured about 50 milliliters of concentrated 25% ammonia. Now I'm going to attach this bottle to our device. Just like this. Now I'm gonna try to relight the catalyst. Relighting in three, two, one. Yes! And immediately you can see dense smokes forming in the receiving flask. Shortly after this restart, I have to shut down the apparatus because I am running out of time. On the next morning, I took it apart and harvested the products. Alright, here's everything taken apart. When I dip some of this solution and put it on a pH paper, you can see it is still quite alkaline, which means we still have a bunch of potassium carbonate in there. I poured the liquid in the absorption flask to the large flask, and bubbles began to form immediately. This is because a little bit of nitric acid formed in the large flask, and it reacts with the potassium carbonate to release carbon dioxide. I poured everything in and shook the flask to get all of the remaining nitric acid. Our silicone stopper held up surprisingly well in nitric acid and nitrogen dioxide fumes. I then poured the liquid in the flask to a beaker on my hot plate to boil it down. This liquid contains most of our nitrogen as potassium nitrate and nitrite. The goal is to boil it down to about 25 ml and cool it down to room temperature to crystallize the potassium nitrate out. Meanwhile, I transferred my solution in the sodium hydroxide scrubbing beaker to a petri dish and leave it to evaporate on its own. Shortly afterwards, 
our nitrate solution begins to boil and release some strong smelling fumes. The fumes are actually ammonia gas mixed with water vapor. Some of the leftover ammonia in the reaction carried over to the absorption flask and reacts with the nitric acid to make ammonium nitrate. Upon boiling, the potassium carbonate converts it to potassium nitrate while releasing ammonia. Therefore, this boiling step is very important to remove excess ammonia. The solution has boiled down to 25 ml. It was slightly yellow green due to the small amount of chromium oxide carried into the absorption flask by the gas flow. It was taken off the heat and allowed to cool. Immediately after it stopped boiling, a layer of crystals began appearing at the top of the solution, which is hopefully our product, potassium nitrate. This indicates that our solution is saturated even at boiling temperatures, and that we will have a decent yield. I removed the stir bar using a magnet and allowed the solution to cool to room temperature. As it was cooling, more and more crystals separated out. They are fortunately purely white and not yellow, which is a great sign that they are very pure. I placed the beaker inside an ice water bath to cool it even further. After the beaker cooled to 0C, its contents were transferred into a vacuum funnel and filtered. I probably shouldn't end the boiling step with only 25 ml of the solution, because as you can see, the amount of potassium nitrate that crystallizes out was comparable to the amount of the remaining solution, making it very difficult to purify. However, I prefer yield over purity, and the other contents in the solution has a far larger solubility than potassium nitrate, meaning that they will not crystallize at all. Anyways, the vacuum pump is turned on, and the mixture was filtered. All the liquid came through quite quickly, and I was left with some white crystals. It was slightly green due to tiny amounts of chromium contamination, so I washed it with a little bit more water. Everything in the funnel was then transferred to a petri dish and dried in air. I included the filter papers because I thought it would be interesting to burn it up once it dried. I also kept the filter paper I used for making the potassium chlorate, and I'd really like to do a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. The filtrate, mostly containing potassium nitrite and potassium carbonate, was left to evaporate on its own. With the potassium nitrate successfully separated out, this concludes the project as an outstanding success. Just to reiterate, I felt extremely proud about this project, more than any other I have done before. It took me a lot of time and effort, but I finally worked through a valve way to generate nitrates from easily available chemicals and equipment. Obviously, the reactor can be further improved to increase its efficiency and making it automated, which is exactly what I will do next. If you have any suggestions on this, I'd love to hear them in the comments. Thank you very much.